for people in California other than the universities, they have research teams. And, uh, and that's very, very interesting, very interesting indeed, okay? So I'm, I'm happy and I'm very optimistic that we are going to produce uh, advances in, in technology and how to understand our brain, you see? Because we are still, uh, we, we, we lack, you see, many, many components that we can uh, emulate a, a okay, brain. Okay, we, we can start. Okay, thank All you very right. much, Maria. Okay, thank you. You, you want to stay? You, you are welcome. If you want yeah, to thank you. Something else? All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thank All you right, so much. Yes, bye bye. Uh, uh, Elba, so let's, uh, let's join them with the Professor uh, Robert Nagy. Robert Nagy is, is here or, or what? Robert? Yes, he's yes. here. Yes, I'm okay, here. Robert. Yeah, Robert. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you very much for waiting. Okay. I, I, I think you saw part of the of the presentation of, of Maria Alme. Yes, Alme. it was my pleasure. It was a very nice presentation and thank yeah. you very much for it. Yeah, it was really interesting. Actually, Maria, uh, Robert, she was. Uh, a Fulbright in Puerto Rico. So oh. we, yeah, mm -hmm. at that particular time, 2006. Ah, yeah. I can see her, his face, yeah, yes. so familiar. Yeah, right. So it's a, it was a part of a, of a program I had with Fulbrighters and uh, she was uh, here in Puerto Rico and she enjoyed uh, uh, to learn about the beaches, uh, about the people. So it was interesting. Right now we cannot, you see, the, the Fulbright doesn't have uh, the program authorized uh, for traveling, okay, because of the pandemic. Right? Yeah, unfortunately, I would really love to see the yeah. place. Yeah, actually, that was the, the reason, you see, I had so many uh, Fulbright friends. I'm a Fulbright myself, Fulbright friends around the world. I invite them and, and the student here, they, they learn about so many fields to the full ride. And that's the most uh, uh, exciting experience, really, for the student. They, they, and now they are all PhD, my students are all PhD, but they say that they were inspired by the full riders, okay? Just to do exactly what they select. And this is the reason why we invite, in this case, in neuroscience. In your case, you see you are in a, a mechanical engineer, but also you are working with biomedical kind of uh, activities. So uh, we would like to see you, your presentation very much, all right? Okay, let me let me tell you the, the people who, who you are. Well, you are a Fulbright, a Robert Nagy's doctor and mechanical engineer, okay? He's a, he is a, from Hungary, okay? He worked in Budapest University of Technology and Economic in Budapest, Hungary. And now he is a Fulbright scholar in the University of Texas, Austin, right? That's, that's yeah. what you are. So and you you are uh, willing to present a, a program, right, in uh, advances in biomedical engineering. All right, so thank you very much for coming and then the, the floor is yours, right? Uh, thank you very much, Juan, for the kind words and the introduction. Uh, let me ask first if you can hear me well or not. Is it all right? Yeah, like I, I'm, I can hear. Uh, probably the rest. Uh, we are. We have 37 students and uh, faculty, and it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of folks. Uh, even we have people in China. Maria is from China. We have other students wow. from Chile. We have yeah. students from Nicaragua. We have students from uh, from Puerto Rico and the uh, Dominican Republic. Okay, so, and some uh, folks are from the United States. So it's an international audience. So it's all yours. So I hope my voice gets everywhere in the world then. Uh, yeah. Let me share the screen, uh, my screen first. And uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Beautiful. So if you can see everything, even the top, because that for me, for some reason, uh, yeah, here it is. How can I get rid of it? 
Uh, can you see the slides? That's probably yeah. what's most important. All right, thank you very much for the feedback. And uh, so let me start. Um, I was asked to talk to you about in the next uh, half an hour about advances in biomedical engineering. That's the title. Uh, but since it is a very vast subject uh, and I only see uh, in depth a small portion of it, which is called biomechanics, I'm going to restrict myself to it. And to be a bit more interesting, I'm going to do it via the example of arterial dilations. It's a deformity called aneurysms. And if you have never heard about it, that's very good and it should be like that. But anyway, I, I, I am going to explain what those are and uh, what research interests can they propagate towards uh, scientists. Um, I am going to start with basics and get to uh, be a bit more specific towards the end. But the important thing about it is the novelty here in research, and these are the tool sets. And uh, I want you to focus on uh, one, especially, which is called finite element method. And this is a numerical simulation technique with which we can solve any type of problem, virtually any type of uh, problem can, uh, that can be described by so-called partial differential e equations, mathematics, and uh, we, can, we can simulate real world problems in our computers and get answers out of it. So that is the most important thing I want you to focus on uh, what I'm talking about now. And uh, I'll mention some other, other novel methods like imaging uh, techniques and uh, other alternatives with which we can get insight into the tissues, even if it's uh, still in the living body. So probably that's the outline and uh, the, the goggles you should wear to see it. Uh, but before I do it, since I'm a Fulbright uh, visiting researcher here in Texas, and that this also has a cultural exchange uh, uh, branch to it or, or aim to it. Let me talk a little bit, just a few words about Hungary, where I'm from. Uh, as you see, and probably most of you know, uh, this is a smaller country in the Middle Eastern part of Europe, indicated by this dark green uh, patch in the map. Uh, the area is about 10 times Puerto Rico's population here you see 10 million approximately and the capital is Budapest where I'm originally from and, and the university I'm affiliated to is located it is called Budapest University of Technology and Economics uh, and if you have the opportunity to visit the country or the city uh, which I strongly suggest you should seize if you have uh, I, I su suggest that you delve into the nightlife. It's very vivid. And uh, Budapest is famous for its spa culture. So if you take my advice, you do it in the winter time when the, when the air is chilly outside and, uh, and the water is almost boiling hot. So it is very pleasant. Um, but uh, that's enough about uh, the background and, and the cultural things. And let's delve into the topic. So as I told you, the field of biomedical engineering is rather a vast forest with a very various type of, of flora and fauna in it. And if you want to pursue this field, you most definitely will be a specialist. And the specializations, just to mention a few, can be seen on the uh, bottom right-hand side of your, of your slides. Just, just uh, uh, as, a, as an enumeration, you can, you can uh, specialize in designing inert biological materials for implants and prosthesis. You can do it with living organic tissues. This is called tissue engineering from the level of the cells, from stem cells, you can develop several tissues as well, cartilages, bones, or even at, uh, you can reach the organ levels. Uh, 
the question you some of you were asking from Maria is related to neural engineering, which is basically how understanding how the brain works first and then how to prepare interfaces communication with with the brain itself and uh, let's say machines and uh, computers there are others like genetic engineering to uh, if you want to understand uh, how the uh, the code in the genetic uh, in the genome and uh, decipher it that is also part of bioinformatics but uh, it, it is more widespread than that uh, a startup company in Hungary, for example, tries to apply machine learning techniques inside bioinformatics to find out how two more cells form, what kind of chemical pathways are necessary to be modified, how can they be identified specifically. So that is also a, a biomedical engineering prospect. You can, you can develop biomedical uh, or sorry, medical devices sensors uh, and also robotics for rehabilitation or just to enhance not even diseased people's abilities but my specialty uh, is uh, a rather down-to-earth one i am actually a structural engineer by training so i try to view the human body as a mechanical structure moving structure so I am in the field of biomechanics and with a slight outreach to medical imaging because that is the most important source of data collection for our, our purposes. Um, what is common in all these fields is that you have to have a strong background in either engineering or science. It can be of various fields, mechanical, electrical, chemical, computational, whatever you can imagine. And you have to have a good knowledge of biology and, and medicine as well. Uh, and all these merged and applied to healthcare make you a biomedical engineer, makes you a biomedical engineer. Um, in my, uh, in the, in the, uh, current talk I am talk about I'm going to talk about aneurysms which uh, as I told you are dilations of the aorta so if you have a vessel a blood vessel and it extends um, we don't call it strictly speaking a disease but a deformity but it can cause several very serious problems and if it ruptures it is uh, most definitely leads to death so we uh, want to avoid it but uh, to characterize it these dilations um, can occur mostly in two locations one is in the brain the so-called circle of willis that is the main supplier of uh, blood uh, to the brain uh, and then the other part is the aorta coming out of the heart there are several differences between these two main locations. For example, uh, in the brain, you mostly find spherical or so-called secular aneurysms, while on the aorta, you can find uh, spindle-shaped, so-called fusiform aneurysms, like you can see it in, this, in these pictures. This is one difference. The other is typically in the brain, you find these aneurysms at bifurcations, at the tip of bifurcations, while in the on the aorta these are just extensions of the side of the of the tube topology itself um, you can distinguish between them by the wall state uh, in uh, the abdominal case or the aortic case you can find aneurysms which do not incorporate all the structure of the wall just the external part these are called false aneurysms uh, and a very important dis distinction is in the aortic case, so in the right, you can and most often you will encounter with thrombus plaque formation. So there, these are lipidous or calcificated uh, depositions inside the flow area inside the arterial so-called lumen. Uh, and that complicates their behavior 
very much. So these are the two uh, locations, aneurysms can be found. And uh, actually just to um, say a few words about the, a few words about uh, the occurrence. This is the, the, I think, in the five leading causes of death in Western society among people aged 60. Uh, I mean, the rupture of these aneurysms, either in the brain or in the abdomen. So it is important to understand their behavior and what kind of questions can be can, can we raise. Uh, neither of these three are perfectly answered at these moments. Uh, the first one, is, uh, why do they uh, start? What is the cause of initiation? The second, if they are already started, how do, we, how do they develop? And when they are developed and, and increase in size, what is the limit they can reach without causing any risk of health to the human? And this is uh, the assessment of the point of rupture. So um, among all genetic factors and uh, health related issues, they're naturally because of the well specified locations and well specified uh, features that they have, we can identify biomechanical factors related to all these three questions. Morphology, the shape, uh, the blood flow condition inside, of course, because it must be, these effects must be important because otherwise we wouldn't say that these type of aneurysms would be specific to all these parts of the body where, where, where well specified shapes and flow conditions arise inside the vasculature. Uh, the other important things, of course, are the stress state of the wall uh, due to the load exerted by the blood flowing inside, what kind of ten tension arises inside the arterial wall. And of course, the arterial wall, being a biological uh, tissue, changes from time to time and their constitution also changes. So that is also a biomechanical factor we can investigate. And uh, just to mention a few candidates to answer these or try to address these questions. The initiation, the starting of these aneurysms is attached to the flow condition inside the wall. So this acronym is resolved as wall shear stress. So the stress caused by the flowing blood inside next, right next to the arterial wall. And if it is large, it means there is a large gradient, very fast moving blood at that location where it is hypothesized as initiation. So it is, uh, we try to find fast moving, moving blood particles there. But after it is initiation, and of course, this will cause some kind of inflammation in the tissue uh, itself. Uh, and once it is caused, the development and the increase is associated by, by slow flow of the blood. This is measured by also this wall shear stress most easily. And uh, this can be rationalized as if the blood flows slowly there, there is a larger opportunity uh, of clots to form. And this also increased further the inflammation and uh, all chemical effects to modify the internal structure of the arterial wall. So that is also a factor of development. Rupture risk is uh, another issue and I will talk about it more today. Uh, this is a purely in a purely mechanical aspect. It happens when the flow induced stresses reach a limit as you see it here. We can measure it by forces or by displacements. But uh, anyway, uh, we can find a limit where the structure breaks. That is a basic analogy to an, uh, another kind of structure as well, like bridges or buildings. We do the same analysis of failure here. All right. But all these questions are, are very di different to answer. And uh, the clinical practice has to have a better and shorter and quicker uh, decision procedure 
And at the moment, uh, the decision of uh, management of aneurysms is based on populational statistics. So they observe several of these deformities. And in this study called in International study of unruptured, let's say this is intracranial aneurysms, so in the brain, they created two cohorts. One which were dealt with surgical issues, uh, surgical methods like microsurgery. They go into the some micro incision here above the eyebrows, go into the brain, and try to clip those aneurysm out of the blood circulation. Uh, or they can insert coils in it. Uh, going up from the carotid artery. And uh, with these catheters, you can reach the desired location and put uh, a biological material, which uh, again closes the blood flow out of these aneurysms. So uh, they either treated these aneurysms with these me methods or not, and seen uh, what the results are in the long term. And uh, this is a statistical way to figure out this is uh, management strategies. And uh, this is a balance where the risk of rupture is greater than the risk of the operation, the hazardous uh, risk of operation or the mortality rate itself. And if the risk of rupture is greater than that, then the operation has to be performed, of course. Uh, and they found out that the most important measure is the diameter, and the second to it is the growth rate. So you have to monitor it as uh, it processes to grow. Uh, just to name uh, a basic uh, values, in the uh, brain, this limit, this diameter limit is five millimeters of these secular aneurysms. And in the aorta, while it's uh, naturally around two centimeters in diameter, if it reaches 5.5 centimeters, it is operated on. I have seen uh, so large dilations as 15 centimeters. So you can imagine how large it is and it can even cause pain in the patient. Although usually it is not painful at all. This uh, is symptom asymptomatic. Uh, so the, with the advent of modern imaging, medical imaging issues, uh, like uh, regular radiologic samples, you, you have a better, better chance to notice it and then uh, manage it. All right, so diameter and growth rate. But uh, the problem is that smaller aneurysms can also rupture. And this is uh, not a... So we can do better. How? So what clinical practice, uh, what the research tried to do with, to improve all these decision strategies? Of course, the first thing is to develop better imaging methods uh, and automate the segmentation process, which means that reducing the living work of radiologists to find these critical points in the, in the vasculature, which are diseased or deformed. And uh, once they are done, if, if, the, if the segmentation is well automatized, then a simulation can be performed on it. First, simulation of the blood flow. And then if you, have, if you go a step further, you can simulate the voles of all behavior as well. Uh, this is a huge step. Seems a small one, but uh, it is quite large uh, and it necessitates uh, not yet viable computing resources in clinical practice. So it is a research, uh, uh, restricted to research at the moment, but it can be done. Uh, and there are further prospects like how can we incorporate the influence of the thrombus, the plaque I mentioned in, in the behavior of the womb. This is not yet. Uh, this is the very basic uh, or initial phase in the research as well. And what I am trying to do is this method called inverse finite element uh, simulation, where based on novel imaging techniques, I try to measure the material properties in the living body without any intervention. 
I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, this is mainly just the mechanical aspect of biological tissues, but these are also living organisms. So we have to incorporate the remodeling of the wall as well, how the deposition of collagen inside is modified by the flow conditions and the stress there and so on. Uh, another future prospect is in uh, applying machine learning uh, paradigms to do all these process uh, in a better way. The segmentation itself, which is the most laborious one, and to find out the boundary conditions, which I'll talk about what those are. These are just the neglected effects, which are we can't incorporate our, in our calculation precisely, but want their effects to be playing a role in our simulation as well. A few words about the arterial wall structure. It is layered, as you see it on the left-hand side. Mainly, we have three layers, intima, which is the thinner one inside, the media, and the adventitia, which is the external part. Uh, the intima is uh, uh, related to biochemical stimuli to the other two, which are of structural importance. And these outer two are composed of an elastin matrix. And in this matrix, there is embedded a collagen spiral. So if you want to imagine the behavior, it is you can have a, the analogy of a sprinkling hose. So a, a plastic matrix, and inside that you have a wire mesh. And the wire mesh it becomes important where the pressure inside the hose is very large, and uh, you want to prevent the, the rupture of, of the hose itself. There are, of course, biological elements like the smooth muscle cells, which can be uh, regulate the shape by chemical stimuli. And um, this, this complicates our approach even more. But uh, I always try to emphasize that even though during your academic studies that will be all, always uh, the case that you try to focus on smaller and more complicated things, but uh, it is very good. It's a good idea to always go back to fundamental ideas and think about it at, at let's say, a uh, high school level. So to say that it can be on a basic model proven that there is an optimal fiber direction, let's say, for these collagen, embedded collagen fibers inside the elastin matrix. And this can be observed actually that uh, in nature occurs in healthy tissues in the external part of the aorta, where it is uh, the role itself is to prevent the, the large extensions. Um, and these behaviors and uh, this compos uh, these constituents and the composition change from uh, time to time. And if you uh, and if humans age, the stiffness of the aorta or the arterial wall and probably all soft tissues increase. As you see it here, you need larger uh, uh, force to get the same elongation. And also the limit uh, maximal extensibility of the wall also decreases with, uh, with age. But even for aneurysms, this is even more significant. The reason behind that is very diverse, but uh, the picture can be shown quite easily in a normal aorta and in a dilated one. These are histological samples, small cuts of the arterial wall. You can see that the collagen fibers here are more fragmented and uh, less abundant. So that is uh, what is the basic cause, mechanical cause of this effect. What are these uh, fragmentations and uh, uh, decreasing amount occur is a biological effect, which is related to mechanical factors. This also can be simulated, but um, um, I just want to mention the, the most important thing is that they, are, they get fragmented and uh, the deposition uh, rate changes and decreases time. Uh, I wanted to show you another novelty which we try to use to find into to replace these histological samples. And this is called multiphoton microscopy. And um, I have a video show you. 
this is a sample of an arterial wall. Here you see a cutout of an aorta, a dilated aorta. Some of the schematic figure is here. And from these uh, specimens, we cut out small portions. This is one millimeter by one millimeter. Oh, sorry, uh, this is a half a centimeter by half a centimeter. And this is scrutinized under this multi-photon microscope. And this uh, video I showed you was just a one millimeter by one millimeter uh, size portion of it. And in it, you have seen green and red uh, lines. And these are collagen and elastin uh, components. So we can measure their orientation in three dimensions because this was this video was uh, the uh, microscope moving into this uh, tissue. So in 3D orientation uh, quantity and uh, it can be even done in the living organ uh, if you have the means to do it. And this is done by this novel imaging multi-photon microscopy, which is done by near infrared uh, bench, uh, bunches of uh, laser light. Uh, and that is the future of histology, in my uh, opinion. Uh, if you have the microscale, you, have, you can have microscopic properties as well. This is a basic experiment or method you just pull it and measure the displacement against the force. So that's how we, we do it as well. Uh, other measurements are carried out in phantom, silicon phantom models. This is the model of an uh, artery and the iliac bifurcation. It is the division of the artery where your legs start. And uh, it is a usual part of uh, aneurysm formation. Here you see this dilation is a symbol of the aneurysm. And in this way, because the silicon uh, material properties are very close to the one that of the aorta, is a good means to investigate it out of the body and uh, measure it uh, without all these uh, biological effects. Uh, I use it for validating the model I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, that's also a way to, to investigate uh, these, these problems. Um, all right, let's uh, try to see how the mechanical viewpoint towards biological problems look like in general. And this is the flowchart of all structural engineers, basically. And what do we do? We try to pre predict what happens to an object structure when forces act on it. Uh, and to do it, we need to form models. And uh, as this, my favorite description of it is, this is the art of scientific neglection, because we want to keep all the important features and throw out all the unnecessary ones, which would just complicate our, our picture and not cont contribute significantly to the result to it. And this is an iterative process. We have to repeat and repeat uh, this model building as we see features emerging during our investigation. So here is the structure in the middle. That's what we want to investigate. And it is related to uh, the outside world, but we, don't, we can't incorporate everything. So we want to lump the effect uh, of the external world into boundary conditions. These are supports. For example, the aorta, you have the, uh, the spine supporting it and all the surrounding tissues. Uh, creates support to it. And of course, there are loads acting on the tissue. For example, you can do it by applying uh, or segregating the blood flow of it and applying just the load exerted on it. Uh, or you can incorporate the blood flow as well and find out the load uh, making the blood move inside 
it depends on your calculation of capacities and how developed the model you can deal with or not. And, uh, but these are just mechanical uh, uh, effects, boundary conditions. There are uh, several other ones. And here we come to bio in mechanics. And these interdisciplinary effects, of course, in, could include temperature, biology, chemistry, all uh, factors you can imagine, electric um, effects if you are dealing with the heart. Um, and if you have these, you can add this to the structure, which is uh, characterized by the geometry it occupies and the material model, so how it behaves under certain loading. And once you know it and created the, uh, the actual model you want to investigate, you have to solve basically so-called partial differential equations, which are just the continuous forms of Newton's second uh, uh, axiom, which is the law of motion, and find out displacement and the stresses inside the structure and inside the arterial wall as well. And we can compare that to a failure criterion after our experiment, for example, on this micro scale tensile tests. Um, let me uh, just visualize how it is done in a very easy example. And in that same way, I will answer why the most important factor in rupture risk estimation of aneurysms is the diameter. So we want to build the easiest model we can imagine. And we imagine the, uh, the aneurysm being a perfect sphere. It is a secular aneurysm. Let's uh, pose it into the brain then. And it is a membrane structure, meaning there is no bending resistance of the, of the tissue, but uh, only tensile, like a balloon. Um, the thickness is uniform and very small compared to the radius. Uh, um, the material distribution is also uniform, it is homogeneous. So the easiest thing you can imagine. And if you can do that, there is a well known. Uh, equation, probably you have learned it even in high school, called Young Laplace equation, which says that the stress or the forces, specific forces inside this uh, sphere is directly proportional to the pressure inside and the radius. So the larger the radius gets, the larger the pressure inside uh, the wall uh, gets as well. And if the pressure, uh, if, if the stress gets large, it is getting closer and closer to a limit, which is the rupture limit. So that is one uh, explanation why the bigger the radius, the larger the risk is. And of course, if you have higher blood pressure, that also increases the risk of rupture. Just uh, to show a curious example here, if you have soap bubbles, of two sizes, the smaller one and the larger one connected to each other, uh, like a, with a straw, for example. And uh, the air, the, pre, uh, the flow of the air is closed initially. And when you open it, my question is what would happen if you open this pathway of air inside flowing? I, I don't want you to answer it. I'll, I'll tell you the answer because I, I don't have much time for it. But there are two options, logically. The uh, first one is, uh, to get to even size, the larger one inflates the smaller one, or the smaller one inflates the larger one. And probably the most intuitive version would be to uh, expect that the larger one inflates the smaller one until both get the same size. But if you uh, view at this relationship, you'll notice that uh, since in soap bubbles, the stress in the foam is the same, so the sigma is the same, uh, and the radius is smaller here and, than there, the pressure on the left-hand side must be larger than on the right-hand side. So the air will flow from the smaller one to the uh, larger one, and that will be the final solution. And that is also a mechanical effect, which is explained uh, by pulmonologists, uh, which is used by pulmonologists to explain certain diseases where the alveola, of, uh, of the small, small bubbles in, in the lung uh, behave in a certain way. 
so that that that, that can be can be readily used there. So this effect explains why the radius is very important, and we can uh, derive it exactly into secular and into tubular aneurysms as well. But this is a very simple uh, model, and in real life it gets much more complicated. So we need a, a, di a different tool, and that's what uh, is at the cutting edge of this biological, biomedical uh, engineering technology and the at the moment is, is called finite element method. It is a numerical simulation technique virtually to solve all kinds of physical, not just physical, all kinds of problems which can be described in a certain mathematical way with partial differential equations. Uh, here are just a few examples. If you want to design a prosthesis, um, you uh, at, uh, now you naturally do it with these simulation techniques. If you want to investigate the effect of a crash to the brain, you also can do it. Uh, pelvis repair, if you have break there, uh, you, have, you can find it easily before the operation, before the uh, surgical intervention, where to put and what type of uh, prosthesis to, to merge them together again temporarily while they, while they heal. Um, you can also figure out how the, the spine uh, behaves and the changes under loading uh, with these simulations. There are also methods which, come, uh, which um, suggest that, that the folding of the brain which is some usually related uh, to mental capacities uh, is related to mechanical effects in childhood. Um, and uh, this is just another uh, different subject used, uh, uh, which uh, finite element method is used for uh, training surgeons. There is uh, the artificial and simulated liver. And uh, that is a, uh, uh, robotic uh, uh, knife, if you wish, and uh, the surgeon can have haptic feedback what he is doing on what he is doing without actually practicing on human bodies, and this could improve their abilities very much. So that also, that is also a way to apply this sim numerical simulation method. And here are the basic steps. I don't want to go through them. The most important thing is you have to discretize the geometry into small parts, which you can solve or approximate, and then put it back together, this solution. Uh, the history of finite element originates from aerospace industry from the 50s, but since then it developed very much. Uh, here you see a few uh, cornerstones on the way. Uh, and uh, softwares you can apply. Some of them are freeware, so you can take a look. And if you are a student, most of them can be uh, acquired without, uh, in a student version as well. So you can fiddle around with all these simulation tools yourself as well, if you wish. Uh, the cutting edge technology in it, which I also use, and that's why I'm here in Texas, because Professor Hughes, my supervisor here, developed a method called isogeometric analysis inside this finite element technique, uh, which um, basically evades this further discretization of the geometry and works on the actual uh, geometric representation of, uh, of the model by splines. So that is also, uh, there are also room for improvement of this technology itself as well. Uh, but how it can be applied to medics, um, uh, medical applications like the vasculature here. I'll uh, show you four examples. And um, they, they all are different uses. The first one will be virtual experiments. You don't need to experiment with the human body, but you can do it in, uh, on the computer. The second one, is find patient-specific solutions. So rather than population or history, uh, history and the statistics, you can prune your management strategy and the decision to the actual properties of uh, the patient you have. And 
The third one, which is uh, again, just uh, in the research phase, is to try to identify the material parameters without any, any experiment, any, any intervention to the living human body. Um, and the fourth one is to follow the growth in the long term, because all these three are uh, temp uh, temporal and momentary uh, uh, answers, provide momentary answers. But in the long run, we are interested in uh, the whole life of the patient, so we can track it as well in, in the future. So this is also in uh, just the beginning phase of research. So the first one, virtual experiment, that is uh, the image of uh, one part of the uh, arteries of the brain, um, where usually we can find aneurysm. This is a healthy, healthy one, but uh, based on these uh, imaging techniques, you see it here, this is called uh, a computed tomography angiography, which uh, uses x-rays in three dimension to get a three-dimensional image of uh, the flow patterns in the brain. And angiography means that you have uh, contrast material injected into the bloodstream to make uh, the image even better to improve it. So we can uh, collect the geometric data, several ones, and uh, get uh, the parameter field uh, we want to investigate. But we want to understand how these geometric parameters have effect or affect uh, aneurysm formation. So we want to get from a simple model to the more complex and understand in the way the effect of all these parameters. Like, for example, first we want to investigate the stationary time independent behavior, then we want to have the positive effect added, then well, what about the wall? We first assume it's rigid, not, not moving at all under the positive blood flow, then it can be elastic and um, all these features can be added on top of the model in the way so uh, the effect can be understood. And not only that, we can uh, perform many, many experiments in that way. Like, like you see, we have performed 7,000 different experiments uh, on, on uh, various geometries. And uh, if you do that, you, have, you can draw qualitative conclusions. This is a very basic one, just to, to see, this is the previously mentioned wall shear stress. And uh, we can find peak values where the aneurysm is uh, usually initiated. These are the wall of the aneurysm sac uh, at this bifurcating artery indeed. Or actually, they are, um, and uh, they are in the range of the aneurysm as well. So uh, that's how it can be hypothesized that this wall shear stress has affected. That's one way, uh, and of course, pressure on the on the wall, which is the driving force of uh, the increase in size of the aneurysm, also can be measured qualitatively and quantitatively as well. Uh, just to mention again one issue, uh, if you measure the pressure drop, like the, the resistance of these bifurcations, you will find that there is an optimal ratio of diameters of the outlet and the inlet. Here it is. And you can uh, see in real life that that actually is the one which nature forms. So that is also a way to, to investigate the optimality of nature as well. So our vasculature is designed, if you wish, or developed in evolu through evolution in a way that uh, the pressure drop, the resistant itself is the smallest possible, causing the uh, least amount of work needed for the heart to pump the, uh, the blood to it. The second is a patient-specific modeling. For that, we need to have a good imaging technique. This is, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide, but if you have the geometry perceived, then this, you have to process it uh, via the computer. And this is image processing. These image processing methods also have a good um, uh, amount to improve, of improvement 
in itself. Um, and once you have it, you can do the simulation through this finite element method of the blood flow and the, and, uh, the stresses in the bowel as well and compared ruptures. Uh, just a few words about medical imaging. Uh, there are several ways, and just uh, to mention a few, the underlying uh, phenomenon can be electromagnetic radiation. Here you see the whole spectrum, and you can utilize the whole spectrum for these for your imaging technique, but you have to be uh, aware the advantages and disadvantages of each. I use for mine uh, X-rays, although the um, resolution is not that good as radio waves for like MR, but uh, the speed is much better. So uh, when I use this material parameter identification, I need uh, not just a picture, but a video. So a very quick imaging technique is needed for me. Um, so that's why X-rays is my preferred method. But of course, this can, uh, this is an ionizing high energy radiation. So we have to be careful with it applied to a patient. Uh, and this is this uh, comes to the third application of finite element method, which is material parameter identification. And that uh, just, I want to say the key idea here is that instead of the usual workflow of the mechanical aspect, knowing the geometry and the loads calculating the displacement, I turn it upside down and measure the loads and also measure the displacement and the connecting effect between the two is the material behavior. So we can identify them. And as you see, here are the changes of material parameters in, in aneurysm uh, visualized. Um, there are several technical aspects, which I don't want to uh, bore you with uh, in very more, much details, but the uh, important thing is that the imaging algorithm here is called electric cardiac gated CT computed tomography angiography, which is, uh, Simp uh, simple CT, uh, three-dimensional uh, imaging technique, uh, synchronized to the heartbeat. So in a heartbeat, I can have a movie of the movement of the organs. Unfortunately, the resolution is not that good. It is in half a millimeter in the plane and one millimeter along uh, the cuts. So the improvement of this resolution is very necessary. And this has to be done by numerical algorithms um, and uh, from these row diagrams, we have to extract uh, the geometry, which there are some clever techniques also related to mechanics. The one is illustrated here and used by me is uh, called active contour algorithm, which is, you can imagine as elastic bands stretched to uh, um, the edges. Of the of these of these grayscale images, so that also has a mechanical relation. This application of a purely geometric uh, thing, and here you see the results. You can you can actually measure the displacement inside the body, the living tissue, living patient, and uh, calculate the material parameters there and the rupture risk. Of course, this has to be validated, and uh, we do it as well on the silicon phantom I've shown you previously. And uh, the fourth and last uh, of these possibilities is to follow the growth of aneurysms via, sim via simulation. And uh, this is uh, necessary for this to be, uh, for us to be able to do this is necessary to incorporate the chemical signaling channels of the tissues uh, initiated by the blood flow as you see it here. And uh, it also has the possibility to, um, to follow the form of these depositions of thrombus and uh, predict in the long run whether a patient will have this inside them or not. So basically, these are the applications of this method, and that's the conclusion of my talk as well. And thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, try to answer it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagy, for your conference. We look forward for uh, any collaboration with you. 
um, students can make uh, or do questions right now. They can raise your hand or you can type in your questions using the chat. Please fill the surveys. Remember that we need your feedback to continue these activities. And I am going to share my screen so you can have the attendance uh, uh, approval or attendance proof that you were here. And let me remember that we have four different um, links to the form. If you are not able to open those, it is okay to send me a direct message and I can send you a PDF so you can fill out the, the forms for today. Um, our next presentation is gonna be next uh, Saturday, December 18. It's about autonomous vehicles. Then we have here the verification of attendance. And while I'm posting that, I will open the floor for questions. Thanks. Do you have questions? Dr. Aratia, you are you are mute. Thank you. Yes, uh, I was saying that the, this was a really interesting, interesting presentation. Maybe for the students, you see, it was too far in terms of uh, their knowledge in mathematics, in computing, in uh, all kinds of fields. But this is what you do when you model, you see, uh, in, in uh, engineering. I'm an engineer myself. I'm an electrical. Uh, the speaker is a mechanical. But we had almost the same, you see, formation in terms of mathematics. Yes, when you are trying to simulate something in the biology, in the biological system, well, it's getting very complicated. And also you have to understand uh, several components of mathematics that uh, are not difficult, but uh, it's a process, okay? You just start, start with basic stuff and you get to a very complicated, but, um, I do uh, recommend the students, you see, to have this, this presentation as a background to see if they are able just to see going into the engineering and applications, okay? Because that's what it takes now, you see, in order to do simulations in a, in a biological system. And he presented very well uh, what, what the steps are and how you just accomplish something. Okay, but I need, we need to see in the meantime. We have a question. We need, yeah, we need the, 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 the faces. From so we can the picture. Yeah, for, yeah, we had a question in the chat or? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Leonid. Yes. Good day. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Maybe you, yes. you can see me, I don't know. Oh, Leonid. You told, we yes, can see and hear you I, well. Okay. You told that you use inverse modeling. Yes. But to my understanding, you do forward modeling with finite elements methods. Can you explain where you use inverse problem solutions like coefficient inverse problem and where you use forward modeling? All right. Interesting question. Of course, let me share my screen again. Yes. Can you do it? Yes. Perfect. Can you see it? Yes. Now so see. in, I wanted to show you four applications of these finite element methods. method. The first two were simple forward approaches of the mechanical way of uh, thinking, which was visualized here. The forward, by forward, I mean, you know, the geometry, the loads and the material behavior. And you try to find out based on these knowledge you have, the displacements and the stresses arising uh, due to these displacements in uh, your structure. Um, so these two first two were basically this simple, usual 
approaches. And um, the fourth one is, uh, can be regarded as that as well. But the third, where I tried to identify material parameters, uh, turns it uh, upside down. Because um, let me come here. Now, you not only measure the load field, meaning the pulsatile blood inside the, uh, the lumen, so-called lumen inside the flow field, but I measure the displacement field as well by this electrocardiac gated CT. So it makes a video of, um, of, a, of, of the moving wall. So I know how it moves. I know under which load does this. Uh, does it do that? And I have to connect the two backwards in an inverse manner and calculate the material parameters inside the model. That is an inverse problem uh, in itself. Great. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes, more or less. Yes. If you have your further requirements. Sometimes Monte Carlo modeling is also... Which one? Yes, Monte Carlo, many forward models can help to, to resolve the parameters, <laughs> so to select yes, the problem. Yes, that is one method. There are several others, but Monte Carlo simulation is, uh, is one. Actually, um, now, um, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but if you are interested in Monte Carlo methods, uh, Random processes can approximate partial differential equations uh, in general as well. And uh, uh, it is an emerging alternative of this finite element technique called a random walk method, have, if you have ever heard about it. It has its limitations at the moment, but uh, by making random walkers and starting random walkers from a certain part of, let's say, a material. If you extend the plate, you start it from uh, several random walkers and uh, measure their paths. You can figure out how the actual point behaves under certain conditions. So yes, that's, that's also a possibility. Perfect. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Robert, I, I had a question. I'm not sure if you are listening to me. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you see, as an engineer, we, we know how to model and how to do things application. And for this biological system, okay, we try to fix it, okay, with medical devices and uh, any other element. Uh, there is another, if it's, I'm not sure, you see, if this condition, because it's the deterioration of the, of the arthur and the, the inside of the body, can it be an approach just to understand the, the, the genetics of those? Because you show in the, the different, different segment of the author, all right? And yes. you say, yeah. Can, can we identify those in, in terms of genetics and just fix it? Uh, you mean genetics uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, try to understand how and how what genetic uh, factors cause this formation yes i think it, yes that definitely definitely that's uh, but a factor i didn't talk about but also it? um it is proven that uh, genetic factors play an important role in it like in a way that uh, if uh, uh, the parents of the patient had these um, conditions is more likely to um, present them as well. So genetic factors play an important role. Uh, we don't understand at the moment how, and uh, these are not the only factors in it, that's for sure, because um, these genetic factors occur everywhere in, in the arterial system, but these aneurysms are very uh, located at very specific points. So you need the constellation of these genetic factors as well, and all these mechanical uh, properties as well. Thank you very much. I, I just was curious about, about that part, okay? All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah because I, I work with Medtronic, 
Mectronic Museum, Mectronic. yeah, Mectronic is the pacemaker company. Yes, and they, well, they try to, to not to fix the, the heart, just to, re, you see, try to help the heart in terms of uh, the, uh, the heart way, okay? And that's what yes. the, 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 the uh, pacemaker does, you see? And, uh, and improve, you see, the living, uh, the living of people with deficiencies in the, in the, in the, in the component of the heart. So I was that, just trying to, to understand. That is a very important thing to do yes. and uh, helping a lot of people, I'm sure. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think it has been uh, interesting for the student to understand, you see, uh, the evolution of this knowledge going into applications, right? Sometimes get the, Yet uh, you have to understand several fields, not just one, right? And not just the biology, the, 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 the form of the body, but just the structure of the body and the, 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 the simulation, how you, you get out with the differential equation, with optimization metal, and all those kind of uh, components that are essential. And the student who, those who are really interested in mathematics, but this is a, this is a field it's an outstanding field, believe me. I'm a mathematician by training, but I'm, I'm an engineer, really, and I just love this kind of stuff, okay? So I really thank you, uh, Robert, for this talk and your time to come uh, virtually to Puerto Rico and to all the other places, and I, I wish you well, and I will, will contact with you just for further, you see, collaboration. Thank you very much, and it was my honor to to be able to speak that here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any other question, guys? Uh, I think uh, we had a lot of people, but uh, uh, Elva, no more questions. Is it? No. Oh, okay. I will get question out of the student because I had a feedback with the student, so I I will ask them. You see about. You see what what they got out of the out of your presentation, and I will feedback that to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very yes. much. My aim was was to motivate the field and get an insight yes. what what engineers do here. Right. Yeah. You did it. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much, Kai, and see you next time. We had a, our next presentation is another Fulbright scholar. He is actually he is a friend. He was in Puerto Rico because. Uh, because really he came here a few years ago, but now he is, uh, he's working in a Renault research with an autonomous system. And uh, he wants to give us a, that feeling of how this car move, you see, autonomously. What do you need for them just to be safe in the highway, all right? And that's, that will be interesting, interesting stuff. Okay, Doc, thank you very much, Elva. If you don't have any other- Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. No, I don't have any more questions. They are asking for the presentations uh, for yes. the talks, but we have the recordings. If the, you know, if the presenter wants to give us a PDF, we can put that into our web page. So thank you so much to all. I will stop recording. So if you want to stay here to continue the chat, you are welcome to do so, but, um, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.